All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 7, Section 4, the Constitutional Convention and Federal Constitution. So recall, 7-3, we had the Articles, Government, and it was revealing its weaknesses in a lot of different forms. You had a debt that couldn't be paid off. There was an inability to put down Shays Rebellion. You had a business or commerce that was in serious trouble, right? So there's all these problems in the nation. And so a group of nationalists, including people like James Madison, who you see pictured here, and Alexander Hamilton, call for a meeting of the nation's leaders in Annapolis, Maryland in 1786. Now, there was no really good turnout. Uh, I think only five states were represented at the Annapolis Convention. However, what was decided at that convention was to call for a much larger convention, and that would eventually become known as the Constitutional Convention of 1787, which was he held in Philadelphia. And the purpose behind the Constitutional Convention was to amend the Articles government. That is, in order to solve these problems, and maybe let's go ahead and put them in red, to solve the problem of war debt, of Shays' Rebellion, of the poor business and economic situation of the country, the idea was to amend the Constitution, or sorry, amend the Articles of Confederation. That, that means, if you're not familiar, change so that these problems can get resolved. However, when they got there, they realized that the Articles government was just simply too hard to work with, and instead they should just start from scratch and create a new government. Now, this was not written within the Articles. Remember, the Articles called for 13 of 13 states to agree to amend it. Here, you essentially had at the Constitutional Convention representatives from uh, each of the states uh, that amounted to 55 people, essentially changing the government outside of what had previously been put forward. But that's what they decided was necessary in order to get, um, you know, to get the nation back on track. So at the Constitutional Convention, there, of course, was uh, much disagreement to be had. And for, you know, a couple months, in 1787, 55 men from the 13 states sat in this room and nailed out and figured out what would be a way to organize a national government. And what they created, the US Constitution, that's what comes out of this, is still the constitution that we have to this day. So uh, one of the biggest questions was representation. The representation is more or less how should, in, you know, in terms of laws, how should the vote be had? Recall under the Articles, we'll call it Articles of Confederation, AOC, it was one state equals one vote. And in order for a law to be passed, you had a nine out of 13. Well, that was not, uh, not ideal for some states. And in fact, those who supported the Virginia plan called for a different type of voting system. And that was proportional representation. And what that means is that the votes should be dependent on the state's population, right? So for example, Virginia, let's say Virginia has a population of 1,000 people, and let's say that Rhode Island only has a population of 100 people. Well, under the Articles of Confederation, Virginia gets one vote and Rhode Island gets one vote. Now it's not purely democratic because in a sense, these 100 people have more political power than these 1,000 people. But one of the key tenets of the American Revolution and one of the points that they really stressed was that no colony, and at this time state, no colony is more important than the other. So equal voting was really uh, you know, how the Continental Congress had operated and how the Articles government uh, operated. The Virginia plan says no. It says instead, if Rhode Island has one vote, because Virginia has a, a you know, 10 times the population, Virginia should get 10 votes, right? Virginia also proposed a bicameral legislative branch that is two houses. 
and proposed for an executive and judicial branch, whereas in the Articles government, there was only one branch. The Virginia plan, as you might imagine, was supported by the big states. So those states that had large populations favored this. The idea of creating two more houses, of creating an executive, a judicial, this amounted to essentially creating a stronger national government, right? At least in the sense that you would have more power into fewer hands like an executive branch. The small states said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And they backed the New Jersey plan, which said, we're gonna go back to the system of equal votes, right? They supported, look, they like the idea that no state is more important than the other. And we want Virginia, Rhode Island, we want each of them to have one vote. And of course, if you have a smaller population, you favor this because this gives you more votes and therefore more political power. They favored the old system of a unicameral legislative branch, but also recognize that there needed to be changes economically that the national government should have the power to regulate commerce. This would solve the problem up here dealing with business. Uh, should have the ability to tax because once you can tax, then you can raise more revenue. That would solve the problem of debt. And so when it came to actually agreeing upon those things, what they come down on is yes, okay, so let's give it, let's give the national government the power to regulate commerce, which they did. Let's give it the ability to tax, which they did agree upon at the Constitutional Convention. Let's create a stronger national government because we're not as weary of a strong national government. We want a government that's strong enough to work, maybe not strong enough to, to take away people's rights, but strong enough to work. So let's create two houses, let's create these two additional branches. That's what they agreed upon. But one of the big concerns, of course, was still between the big states and the small states. And this question about representation and should you do it according to population or should you do it according to one state, one vote, appeared to be an issue in which the country might be forever deadlocked. But the Connecticut Compromise was created and that was to create a bicameral legislative branch, that is two houses, one house would be the Senate. That would be one state, two votes, right? Each state gets two senators. And in the House of Representatives, it'd be based off population. So big states today, like California, get something like 55 votes in the House of Representatives. Smaller states like North Dakota only get one. And that in order for a law, right? If you're gonna get a law, you have to go both through the Senate and through the House of Representatives, right? So you had to pass through both of these things. And this compromise was good enough to get the, um, you know, to get the country to side on. And it's called, for that reason, the Great Compromise. So the question, question about representation did have an answer, right? There was an answer to that question. Now, another big disagreement there was this question about slavery. Recall you have Northern states who are moving towards emancipation, right? We call them free states. And you have Southern states, which are not, right? Which do uh, continue the practice of slavery through the revolutionary period. Now, there was no talk about abolition, right? So they're not arguing about whether states should be free or slave. For the most part, they recognize that that question would be really on sort of a state's rights level. If Pennsylvania wants to eradicate slavery, that's Pennsylvania's choice. If South Carolina wants to keep it legal, that's South Carolina's choice. So it's not about the abolition of slavery. It's not about free or slave. The question was, do slaves count for representation? So if we go back up, to our example here, right? Let's say Virginia has a population of 1,000. Well, one question to ask is, does that count slaves, right? Does it count slaves? Well, in this case, you could see that, well, we're just gonna say just for the example that no, in this case, it doesn't. But if Virginia, let's say they have a population of 500 slaves, well, if 
they can count their slaves towards their representation, this number changes to 1,500. And instead of having 10 votes in the House of Representatives, now Virginia has 15 votes. And what that essentially amounts to is more political power, right? More political power. So the Southern states or the slave states, they said slaves should count. And the Northern states, right? So this is South. North said slaves should not count because there's not a large number of slaves there. Uh, and essentially what they came to agree upon was that slaves would not be counted as a full person, but instead would be counted as three-fifths of a person and hence the three-fifths compromise. So going back up to this example, if there are a thousand free white citizens in Virginia and 500 are slaves, well then for the purposes of representation to decide how many people Virginia can send to the House of Representatives, we're just gonna say that it's 1300, right? Because those 500 only count for 300 for the purpose of representation. So this gets changed then to a 13. And so this compromise, what it ends up doing is that it creates a disproportionate amount of political power for slave states, right? Slave states essentially get more votes because they have more slaves, even though those votes don't actually reflect the will of those individuals, right? The will of those people who are enslaved. Uh, we'll talk more about this question about slavery, but it's just the beginning of what becomes a very tumultuous period uh, between the Northern states and the Southern states. Another question was, well, to what extent should the new government be democratic? Now. What all of the founding fathers more or less recognized, who, who were there at the convention, this isn't true of everybody in the nation, but what they recognized was that, you know, there, there was a need to curb some democracy here, right? For the sake of effectiveness, or democratic. And in their eyes, the Articles government was too much side on this, uh, you know, demo, uh, the democratic side, or at least it wasn't strong enough. And so still this balancing act is being done, right? Tyranny or anarchy. Again, you don't want something too democratic so that it's anarchy. You don't want something too strong so that's in tyranny. You also have to keep in mind that these are just 55 guys in a room making this. And the question is, will the nation accept it? Right? So everybody says we want a stronger government, we want a more effective government, but let's not get too close to this side of tyranny. And one of the things that comes out of this is the election process by which the president is chosen. And so we end up with sort of this odd system called the Electoral College, which is a perfect example of really what many of these founders were trying to do, or, or it illustrates the struggle between trying to create a government strong enough to function, but not tyrannical, but democratic so that it reflects the will of the people, but that it's not anarchy. So the electoral college is a process by which the president is elected, All right? The electoral college is a process by which the president is elected. It's not left up to a popular vote. Rather, you have a certain set of uh, electors from each of the states. So you add the number of House plus the number of Senators, and that's how many votes each state has, right? So it's kind of a combination of the, uh, of, of the House and the Senate. And the idea back then was that by creating these electors, you're not necessarily allowing for just pure democracy where the people can choose because in their eyes, you don't really want the people to choose because they're not informed very well. They, they don't sort of um, have an investment in the country like maybe some of the more educated and elite members of society. You're guarding against the democratic process. And the hope is that these electors are somehow like leading citizens. They're educated, they're involved, they know the issues and they'll make a better choice. And that's essentially how we end up with this system.
It's not democratic on purpose, right? It's not democratic on purpose. That's the idea. And so when this document is finished, and here you have a copy of the Constitution, of course, famously, the first three words, we the people, to reflect that, uh, you know, that is the source of authority for the governing document. There's a question about ratification, and ratification essentially is the approval. You know, would the rest of the country approve this? And they set up a ratification process where they determined that nine out of the 13 states had to approve. Those who approved the new constitution were called the Federalists. So they approve the new constitution. And a group of them, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, who were all Federalists, wrote the Federalist Papers, which argued uh, to vote yes on the new Constitution, right? Vote yes on the new Constitution. The Anti-Federalists opposed the new Constitution. They said it's too powerful, right? Too much power in a centralized national government, not enough power to the people, not enough power to the states. And even though the anti-federalists were somewhat disorganized, they all opposed the constitution. They didn't necessarily have a replacement for it. But one of the things that they all agreed upon was that this constitution was lacking a bill of rights, which is, uh, you know, was was had been created before on the state level in Virginia but you know it was protection from the government for certain rights and when the founders wrote the Constitution there was no Bill of Rights and more or less what the anti-federalists said was look until you include a Bill of Rights we're gonna vote no and probably the most famous of the anti-federalists was Thomas Jefferson. All right, he was probably the most well-known of the anti-federalists. And of course, you know, fearing this idea of centralized power. So uh, eventually, the federalist side won. And the new constitution would be put into effect with the promise that they would include the Bill of Rights at a later time.